But yeah. we've done our introduction, so, um, and I think um, you know the, the, the idea behind this discussion group, James, um, I've intimated to you is to talk about um, current issues and particularly what we're looking at is private law and the uh, public policy issues. So the 2016 Act fell squarely within what you might traditionally see as a private law topic, but actually an area where there are huge public policy issues and things that um, you can't just keep your nose to the legislation. You've got yeah. to look at how this works and what's affecting it. So um, this is our third in our season, or our, our uh, programme. So, um, um, so we're very pleased to have you here. Thank you for taking the time out. Um, thank you. Without further ado, yeah. I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak. Um, yeah, so as I've already, I've already kind of introduced myself, but my uh, my role at Shelter is as a project manager within the policy team, and we, uh, as you can imagine, had a strong interest in uh, private rented sector issues, and we uh, also lobbied for a lot of change in the, in the private rented sector, and had a. Um, we were, I suppose, one of the driving organisations behind uh, the, the call for um, this new uh, legislation. Um, and yeah, so if you just put to the next slide, I think I think this is what Stephen initially asked me to present on, and it was I don't know if I quoted you entirely correctly in that, but I think as you said earlier, it's about. Um, the extent to which the Scottish Government in this reform was trying to achieve public policy objectives uh, through private actors, and those private actors in this case are private landlords, and the uh, public policy aim being increased security of tenure for uh, private tenants. Um, and I'm going to kind of dodge the question uh, <laughs> immediately, as all good presenters do, um, uh, mainly because we didn't really address that as, as an organisation ourselves. We had a, some, some pretty strong views that there should be some change in the private rented sector, but I suppose we didn't really engage with this question as to whether private landlords should be uh, the ones delivering a public policy objective, although I think as we go through the slides you'll get an idea of our view on that, and also we can have a bit of a discussion afterwards about some of the implications of this. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So just a, a bit of a general kind of summary of what we do as an organisation. We're, we're um, a campaigning organisation and we also offer services to people who are badly housed uh, or uh, homeless, uh, primarily through our free housing advice uh, helpline and we've also got a, a, a range of other uh, kinds of advice through housing advisors to um, uh, solicitors. I apologise for that noise, it's like email inbox. I think it's going to keep pinging. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and we we had around 12,000 calls last year to the helpline, and we get over 600,000 visits to our advice pages each year. So that's just a bit of a flavour of what we do. Um, so in terms of this uh, reform, this is just a bit about the the background, and it's going to get a bit statistical for the next few slides. Um, the private rented sector in Scotland is increasing size hugely over the past 15 years. Now around 350,000 households call the, the private rent sector home and that's now, um, so it's, it's tripled, it almost tripled in size since 1999. And just to give you a kind of idea of its size now, it now houses more households than local authorities do in Scotland, um, which is it's, that's quite significant. It, it, it isn't bigger than the whole social rented sector, but it, uh, private landlords themselves house more people than local authorities do in Scotland. So uh, that gives you a sense of the kind of the, the scale of the of the sector, and also the traditional view of who would live in the private rented sector has kind of changed a lot since uh, about 10, 15 years ago. Back then, you might have thought that the the private rent sector would typically be the, the home of students or uh, young professionals or uh, people who generally weren't seeking long-term tenure. But now, as you can see, there's two statistics there, 26% of households 
uh, in the front range so we can see children, which is around 91,000 households. And also, um, we've got around 41% of, of uh, younger households, 16 to 34 year olds, renting in the sector, which is a huge increase on, up, up from 13% in 1999. Um, so, the, the needs of those tenant groups have, are a bit different to, to those that, uh, that were perhaps around in the uh, uh, around 1999. Um, next slide, so, so these are just a couple of graphs. That, that's just showing you the growth of the sector. The bottom blue line there is, is the private rented sector from 5% in 1999 up to 14 in 2015. Um, the other significant thing in this uh, graph is also the, the purple line. So 32% of, of households re were renting from uh, local authorities or social landlords in 1999, and that uh, is now down at 23% in 2015. So at the same time as the private rented sector grew, the social rented sector uh, shrank, uh, and as the top line there is home ownership, and that's uh, uh, broadly uh, remained the same. Um, and if we just, yeah, next slide, please. Um, and this is just showing you generation rent, really. So that's 16 to 34 year olds in the private rented sector. And as you can see, 13% in 1999, up to 41% in 2015. So that's probably one of the most striking uh, changes that we've seen. And that group of, of people is, it, it's a mixture of, of people, really. Um, partly it's young households who, can't access home ownership, uh, mainly because of the, the barrier of not being able to uh, raise a deposit for, uh, uh, for uh, and for them to access a mortgage. Um, also, it's harder now to secure a, a socially rented home um, as well. So you have um, a kind of a new breed of, of, of young renters who might be on in jobs with low incomes or low pay and also renting from the from the private rented sector. So there's kind of a lot in there as well. Um, yeah, if we just move to the next slide. And so we, we obviously measured those, and have kept an eye on those trends as an organization. Um, and in addition to that, we also have our own experience of, uh, uh, from the people who phone our, our, our helpline and use our uh, services. So. This is kind of breakdown of our caseload uh, from last year, and we had around 46% of our calls relating to private rent sector issues. Um, so the, the, the sector is really uh, overrepresented in terms of the issues that we see uh, day to day at Shelter Scotland, and you, you know, only 14% of uh, households uh, rent in the sector. Yet nearly half of all the, the uh, calls we get relate to private rent sector issues. Um, in addition, around 18% of homeless applications in Scotland come from the, uh, the private rented sector, um, and only, only around 12% of homeless applications come from the social rented sector in Scotland. So arguably it's overrepresented in, in the homeless system as well. Um, so kind of over, over time, more has been asked of the, of the private rented sector uh, in Scotland. Um, and more questions have been asked about whether it's fit for purpose. And we obviously are clearly of the view that uh, uh, there are some changes that need to be made to make renting better for the, for the people that call that sector home. And here is this, this case study example from uh, our um, services kind of outlines that this is kind of on the extreme end of the problems we, we see at, at Shelter, but it, it um, it's a good example of, of why we felt that a new private tenancy with enhanced security of tenure was uh, necessary. So this client is living with their partner and two young children in a, in a private rented flat. And there's various repairs issues, uh, including leaking shower, insecure windows, nails sticking up from the floor, and uh, radiators not properly attached to the wall. Uh, the particular issue that they came to us with was that their shower had been removed from the property and never replaced. Um, they 
complained to their landlord several times about the property, but no action uh, was taken. Um, with our assistance, they went to the, the private rented housing panel, which is the uh, the tribunal which hears uh, private rented sector repairs issues, amongst other things, in Scotland. Uh, however, soon after the complaint was lodged with that panel, the, the landlords decided to end the tenancy. Uh, and <coughs> the tenants had to simply leave the property and find uh, somewhere else to live. So why is that the case? Well, in our view, it was because of the way that the Housing Scotland Act and the uh, short assured tenancy regime uh, operates. So, as I'm sure some of you might know that the, the Housing Scotland Act 1988 lays down the uh, uh, legal framework for both assured and short assured tenancies. Assured tenancies, on, on the one hand, are uh, security of tenure is effectively indefinite, so tenants can stay for as long as they want to effectively, so long as they stick to all the the, uh, the tenancy agreement and the landlord doesn't have a, a valid reason to end the tenancy. But under the Act, short or short tenancies can also be uh, created uh, via the service of, it, of in what's called an AT5 form. Um, uh, and these tenancies are by far the most common tenancy type in Scotland's private rented sector. Um, these, this particular kind of tenancy, the initial period is of uh, no less than six months, uh, but after that, and it, this depends on how the landlord sets out the tenancy agreement, but often we would see agreements where tenants have no more than around two months security of tenure. Uh, that's not always the case, sometimes uh, tacit uh, relocation can, can operate and the, the tenancy might repeat for its initial period uh, once it comes to the end of its, the, the, the initial period. So essentially, landlords, most landlords in Scotland, the vast majority who rent to uh, rent to tenants with a short-term tenancy, have access to what we was commonly termed no-fault eviction via Section 33 of the Act, and that means that basically landlords can uh, ask a tenant to leave the property um, without providing them with a reason other than they want to end the uh, the contract. And this kind of bred a bit of a, a a feeling of in terms of repairs issues and and uh, and other aspects of private renting. It kind of is, has led to a what's the point uh, kind of feeling amongst many private tenants, or I can't risk it. And the feeling that feeling of insecurity really did it definitely pervades amongst the tenants that um, that, that come to us. Uh, uh, and uh, for help and advice, they, they feel really insecure in their in their uh, in their tenancy, and feel like they can't ask for basic repairs to be to be carried out in in many circumstances. So we uh, obviously identified that we felt that there should be uh, that security tenure should be increased, um, and these are some of the the, um, the reasons that we. Uh, we felt it should be increased. So, as I've already kind of said, great ability for, for tenants to challenge poor conditions. In a, in a well-functioning market, um, tenants should, should be able to uh, be on as much as possible and, and equal footing with, with their landlord in terms of asking for a high quality of service. And we felt that that, that wasn't the case. Um, uh, Frequent moves outside the control of tenants could be reduced as well, and there's good evidence to say that if you need to move frequently, you're less likely to be registered with your GP, your dentist, uh, and you're also not going to be um, uh, potentially not beside your uh, more informal support networks, for example, your family and friends. Um, potentially a positive impact on communities as well. There's, Evidence to say that uh, private renters are less involved in, in community activities than than uh, people who uh, live in other uh, tenure types. Um, we also felt that there um, that there would be greater stability for both landlords and tenants from from this as well. So landlords would have to, while they would, for some they would have to perhaps raise their raise their standards. For others, with tenants being encouraged to see the sector as somewhere where they ca they can live long term. 
some landlords wouldn't have to account for void periods perhaps as much as they would otherwise have to do. Um, and we did obviously recognise as part of forming our arguments, our policy arguments, that it, it, it was a bit of a balancing act between landlords and, and, and tenants. And we tried to, uh, to make that part of our, our, of our policy and, and campaigning asks. So I've talked about tenants a fair bit, obviously. Uh, but for, for landlords, the, the tenancy was complicated and confusing. It was made almost deliberately complicated to issue a short term tenancy uh, um, because of the service of the AT5, which used to happen before the signing of the actual agreement. So often landlords would forget to do that and then grant a tenant indefinite security of tenure without really realizing it. And there are a number of other forms in which need to go with the, with the tenancy as well. So, and there's also actually the, the way the, 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 the agreement's written uh, perhaps isn't as modern as it could be. So we, we felt that, and many landlords felt as well, that we, there'd be some streamlining lining of regulation and just kind of a, a modernization of the tenancy. Um, and the other key thing for landlords too was ac or is access to justice as well. They felt that the, the sheriff court or the sheriff court doesn't offer them the the uh, um, enough security that they can sort things out when things do go wrong. So it wasn't responsive enough on the one hand to primarily to be honest eviction actions, uh, and that sheriffs often didn't appear to know enough about the um, the private rental sector itself. So they weren't expert uh, decision makers in, in their eyes. Uh, and that, that may or may not be true, but I think there is definitely um, a sense that for, for many sheriffs, the private rent sector isn't their bread and butter issue. If anyone's, I'm sure as you're all uh, involved in, in law in some, in some way or another, you, you appreciate that the, the, the courts are full of other issues, primarily criminal issues. Um, so. We were very supportive of the of another policy development, which is the uh, shifting of all eviction and non-eviction matters into uh, a new tribunal from the end of next year. Um, yeah, so and this is um, this probably sorry the noise again. Probably should have come a few slides earlier, but this is kind of just to show that in many ways Scotland and in fact the rest of the UK are outliers. In, when compared to the rest of Europe and the security of tenure that private tenants have. So as you can see there, it's a, it's a sliding kind of uh, a scale of, uh, of private uh, security of tenure in the private rent sector, Germany being the best in a way with indefinite contracts and uh, some rent restrictions, Spain, Republic of Ireland and France, all with uh, contract terms, initial contract terms, which are a lot longer than the six months that the uh, short assured tenancy grants um, uh, private tenants uh, in Scotland. And indeed, the assured short hold tenancy does uh, in England as well. Um, yeah. And there's various other things. In, in Germany, there's, there's some moderate rent control as well. Uh, and also in, uh, in Spain, and um, yeah, please move to the next slide, Stephen. Great. Sure, so the, as I said, we're a campaigning organization. And you can see my face there if you look closely. <laughs> so this is us um, at the Scottish Parliament on the day that the, the private rented housing Scotland bill was passed, um, along with the, the housing minister and three other uh, politicians you might, someone you might recognize. Um, so, yeah, as I, as I said, we were we were we campaigned uh, quite hard on on this issue for the reasons of of I've kind of gone through, uh, and the ne the next slide shows our our suitably vague campaign asks, which they they have to be to in order to get traction with the public and uh, uh, and other people. Uh, so we we were saying we wanted to make renting right and we wanted stability, and by that we meant security of tenure, flexibility. So. We wanted a tenancy that would 
still be able to accommodate students and young professionals or young workers who don't uh, the money to move around at, at short notice and want to move around. A simple and clear model tenancy to kind of address some of the concerns from landlords around the complication of, of the of, uh, surrounding the tenancy. A dispute res resolution system that was fair and that's the tribunal that we were uh, looking at there and also uh, predictable and reasonable rents for tenants and landlords. So this, um, that's what we were campaigning on and this is kind of a summary of what the Scottish, Scottish Government was up to over the, over the time of our camp campaigning. So it, it published a strategy to, uh, for the private rent sector in 2013 and in that was a commitment to review the, the private tenancy and that they set up a review group which reported in 2014 and landlords and tenants were on that review group um, which recommended that government devise a new tenancy. Then the government consulted, so there were two consultations on proposals for the new tenancy, one in late 2014 and one in early 2015. And again this is another very vague uh, policy statement and the, the government's intention in its reform was to provide security, stability and predictability for tenants as well as appropriate safeguards for landlords, lenders and investors. Uh, and that the bill was introduced to Parliament in, in October and passed in March of this year. So this is what the government, um, uh, this is what the bill uh, and, and Parliament ended up um, agreeing. Um, so the new the new tenancy will come into force in uh, late uh, 2017. There'll be most importantly for us and our campaigning objectives. There'll be no uh, equivalent Section 33 notice. So no fall eviction under the 1988 Act will not be possible under the new tenancy. So effectively, tenants, um, at least in terms of the policy intention will be given enhanced, uh, indefinite security of tenure uh, through the tenancy um, and also the, the tenancy will be indefinite basically from the beginning, there will be no initial period or, or a trial period. Um, landlords and tenants sign that agreement and as long as the tenant sticks to the agreement and the landlord doesn't have a valid reason for uh, seeking possession of the, of the uh, of the property, then the, the agreement should just continue indefinitely. Um, and yeah, tenants are able to give 28 days notice to leave at any point. So and that includes from the very beginning of the tenancy. So that's actually a bit controversial amongst uh, some landlords, I have to say. Um, and yeah, landlords need to give 28 days notice if a tenant's breached the agreement or they need the property back if the, the agreement that hasn't is um, or the tenant has been in the property for under six months. Um, um, after six months, it's three months. This is the one we need to go. So yeah, as I kind of said before, the um, security of tenure will depend on obviously the grounds for possession um, and. The uh, landlords must use one of the grounds for eviction to recover possession. That sounds like a bit of an obvious point, but um, previously that wasn't necessarily the case. So the difference now really is that landlords need to provide a reason to the tenant for the tenancy coming to an end. Um, and those reasons include intention to sell, intention to refurbish, uh, and also intention to move into the property. And there's 16 grains in total, 12 mandatory, so uh, sheriffs or the tribunal must grant the order if they uh, think the grounds, the conditions for the ground is met, and four have discretionary elements. Um, yeah, if move on. And there's also some provisions around rent as well. Landlords can't raise the rent more than once per year. A bit more predictability over the current system where if you're in a rolling two month tenancy period, technically the landlord could put the rent up at every two month interval. Uh, and similar to uh, the power to 
refer rents to the private rented housing panel now, tenants can refer the rent to the rent increases to the rent service Scotland. Another um, uh, issue that there's a lot of debate around during the passage of the bill was rent control and there's a lot of pressure on the Scottish government and politicians to consider the issue of rent control um, in the passage of the of the bill and uh, the uh, Scottish ministers ended up there was devising a system of, of rent control where local authorities could apply for rent pressure zones to be applied in certain areas um, where um, rents rent increases um, are limited for sitting tenants um, to a and those rent increases are limited to a, a formula based on the consumer price index plus one percent plus another number which would be to be determined between uh, Scottish ministers and the and the local authority that applied for the for that uh, rent uh, pressure zone to be applied. Um, so that's that's the private tenancy. Then there are a few other related policy developments as well. I've already talked about the tribunal a little bit though. Uh, start hearing cases, um, private rented sector cases from December 2017. Letting agents will also be regulated from early 2018. And also, and I think this touches upon what Stephen asked me to talk about as well, and that is that in England, private landlords now need to carry out immigration status checks on prospective tenants, which um, again is pretty controversial, uh, and we could perhaps talk about a little bit about that if we have time in the in the discussion as well. The reason I haven't really focused on it very much is because there's no update as to when and if, even if that will be rolled out to Scotland. Um, and yeah, next slide. And this is kind of other, so I suppose speaks to the decline in the number of uh, people who uh, uh, rent from local authorities and and, and uh, housing associations in, in Scotland. The uh, the Scottish government committed to building 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this Parliament. So, given that the the tenancy that both local authorities and housing associations use, which is the Scottish Secure Tenancy, which grants again effectively uh, indefinite security of tenure, this kind of speaks to the the need for security of tenure for um, uh, for many of the, the households who might be living in the private rented sector now, uh, and particularly those for whom obviously that find the rents in the private rented sector particularly high uh, in comparison to their income. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, just to in terms of a con conclusion, we felt that there was definitely a clear justification for extending security tenure in that way, um, just by virtue of the size of the sector and the, the volume of um, complaints that we saw on a day-to-day -day basis from from private renters, and particularly the, the, the change in demographic of, of the rented sector. Families with children just need that extra bit of, in our view, stability and security that security of tenure offers. Um, and yes, yeah, Scotland's a bit of an outlier on, on this in Europe, and just kind of suppose almost finally, it's not a new concept to Scotland. Security of tenure in the, in the private rented sector, we had indefinite security. Well, the, the assured tenancy regime provides for that, and that was uh, always intended to be the, the main tenancy in in Scotland when it was when it was devised in. The, uh, uh, before 1988, um, and it's the the short tenancy itself was never actually intended to be the main form of tenancy, and it was made deliberately difficult to issue a short tenancy through the service of the 85 form. Um, so it's kind of evolved in a bit of a funny way, uh, the private rent sector over the past 15 years, um, and yeah, as you might imagine the. In our eyes, the success of the reform should be measured by the extent to which that security of tenure is, is genuine and effective, which relies on the tribunal working, it relies on landlords using the agreement, it relies on tenants um, uh, challenging landlords and, and making sure that they have these agreements as well. 
Um, yeah, so that was a kind of a whistle stop tour of what our take on this policy change. Um, and it'd be, yeah, it'd be good to get your uh, reflections on what the Scottish government has has uh, has done its and its its approach to this to this particular issue. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, James. It's <coughs> a, a real way a treat for us to get an insight from someone who's actually sees how this works in practice, and then actually how the bill has went through and um, understood the different stakeholders in that process. So, um, thank you very much. Yes, James says, does anyone have questions? Private rented housing tribunal is, is intended to be that first step in terms of uh, complaining about a repairs issue if you've already written to your landlord and asked for them to rectify it. Um, but local authorities too, as as you pointed out, uh, can take action if the if a property doesn't reach the, the tolerable standard, which is a really low a really low standard in comparison to the, the repairing standard. Um, and I think part of uh, whether the, the private incident does improve in terms of quality will rely on local authorities perhaps taking more of an active role in, in regulating the sector generally. Um, but for us, we just saw um, we saw too many examples of where tenants had made a complaint about a landlord or asked them to the landlord to comply with their legal that legal agreement and then the landlord gets to a point and says that this is too much hassle, I'm just going to end the tenancy and that landlord may then may well then just rent out the property to another to another tenant and the issue may continue. So that's that was our thinking and, and our approach in terms of asking for uh, or campaigning for extended security tenure in the way that we do. Okay. My understanding is that the, the landlord wouldn't have been able to effectively evict the tenant without a court order. So would there have been any scope for saying that in the circumstances such as that, that the tenant was able to, um, if you like, mount a defence to the eviction proceedings, saying that there was an issue with the peer which hadn't been dealt with, and, or prohibiting yeah. a landlord from exercising the right to recover possession yeah. um, if there was an ongoing yeah, and that's that's an alternative way of uh, of addressing that that problem, um, and it's one that I think is now I don't know if it's enforcing it or not, but it's mm -hmm. certainly something that's been uh, through Parliament in, in England. Uh, but we felt that given that the, the other benefits that security of tenure would offer, more generally uh, to private renters, that was the better fix in terms of these. The repairs issues that we see, and also the kind of the more general need for security of tenure amongst the other groups of tenants who who, who rent the private landlords, for example, families and things like that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, it, it's a, a general question about why the we saw those changes in the size of the private rented sector because the original deregulation of the Housing Scotland Act in 1988, and for several years that actually didn't make much difference. So the the big expansion is much more recently. Yeah. So what's driving that? Is it uh, the tax treatment of renting income, or is it other things, or a bit of a bit of everything? As uh, it's a um, the UK um, housing market. And this Scottish housing market is obviously a bit of a complicated mm -hmm. um, 
you know, on the tenant side, there's obviously the push towards tenancy because when their occupation has become less affordable. Yeah. But, so, but then, at the same time, supply of accommodation, the landlords have got to be providing it. Yeah. At the same time, we'd we'd seen um, the kind of increased prevalence of buy to let mortgages yeah. driving mm -hmm. a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, so people were obviously encouraged to uh, to in, in invest in in private renting. Uh, uh, in that way, we've also seen so housing supply be pretty mm -hmm. sluggish mm -hmm. over the past, well, maybe 20 years, maybe 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 longer. Um, in terms of the social rented sector, we've seen a lot of demolitions uh, uh, and a lot of houses lost through the right to buy as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that stock is, is constrained as well. Um, and obviously, there's there's a deposit issues mm -hmm. that, that Ed talked about as well that um, uh, has has acted to uh, sort of block some people from accessing uh, home ownership. So that's a kind of a complicated answer, but um, uh, yeah, I'd say it's the main thing really is is the is the is the, is the, is the prevalence of buy to let mortgages mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and it's kind of the uh, almost encouragement of, of uh, uh, that uh, prospective and landlords and uh, and current landlords had to 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 put money into the sector and buy buy houses to rent it. I may ask a question. Yeah. But, uh, anyone else, please feel free. Um, we have started teaching this act to the students, and I had a class on Monday, I think. Or Tuesday, and it's really interesting. Robbie, you'll be doing. I had it on Monday that on this one. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, as we're going through it, a student in the tutorial just like asked a question, and then there was recognition from their colleagues that this was something they wanted to know about. And it was like, why, why let someone not pay their rent for two months or three months before evicting them? They were like, does that not leave a landlord unable to pay? Their mortgage, and it was just the as they are encountering this, and um, I kind of don't look at it through that because I'm mm -hmm. used to this sort of protection for um, tenants. But I wondered mm -hmm. how you would answer that, knowing the sort of context within which this works. How you could say to them, look, actually, there's a good policy reason or a good justification. Um, well, obviously, being somebody who works with shelter, we'd say that. The tenants in that situation we need to seek money advice and all the all the rest of it. Um, but in terms of uh, the issue of rent arrears, that that was something that that is a concern of landlords right now as well. And the frustration they have at the moment is around the court proceedings and how long that can take to actually get a uh, decree to to evict um, a tenant who hasn't been paying their rent. Um, and I suppose part of that will be answered by the, or hopefully for, for, for landlords, will be answered by the new tribunal, which ideally should be more responsive <coughs> to, to those issues. Um, I can't remember exactly what the, the ground for rent arrears is in terms of the, the amount of arrears that a landlord can evict for, but I think it is, I think they can, they can begin a, an eviction Procedure. I think after one month's rent has been accrued, they, they're not guaranteed the, the eviction at that point. Um, so, is it section? I think it was the one in the tutorial. I think there's a few months of you. I think it was. Yeah, it's between twelve and yeah. part three of schedule three. Uh, but it's more actually. Um, <laughs> I suppose. You, James, you were sort of hesitant there to say, actually, no, that person needs money advice, etc. Because my answer to them had been, well, actually, we've just looked at the Homeowner and Debtor Protection Scotland Act 2010. Right. That also puts in this mm -hmm. procedure. Yeah. Because what we're talking about here is compounding people's problems. Because yeah. if you evict someone, um, it's not going to end very well. It's not. It's the last resort. And, yeah. Um, so I, I presume that would be also the sort of answer you would give about the bigger picture here. 
Um, yeah, and I suppose part of this is, I suppose, a bit of a worrying thing about the, the private rent sector is that uh, a lot of landlords aren't able to. Um, I need to be careful with what I say to the camera. <laughs> but we've aren't able to, given how they've set themselves up, aren't able to um, sustain over years for a very long period of time at all. It could all fall to pieces, given how they might have set up their own financial yeah. situation. So that is not a good thing in public policy terms, really. Um, I see that as being a big issue. It's also an issue with repairs. That you do have a sector which is predominantly composed of small businesses, and in some cases it's a one-house business, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and I'm sure, that I, I don't know what the relative statistics, I mean the buy to let um, incentives will encourage some people to build up big portfolios, but also encourage lots of new, I, let, I rent one house things, so it's a very small and fragmented mm -hmm. sector, albeit the social side of it is growing, and yeah. as you say, it's it's people who don't have a big financial cushion to, to bear rent arrears if they've been going over a long period of time mm -hmm. and they have taken a degree of risk um, on the mortgage that they've taken out. So I think I think one of the public policy things is to work out how to make the market sustainable. If, if, if the public policy goal of the Scottish Government is to have a large private rented sector, and I'm sure it is, I can't remember if they said it, but they're, they're not proposing social renting bills or anything like the scale that would do it we don't need it and equally they're not proposing anything that's going to turn around the an occupation thing so they've got in the medium term to have a large private rental sector i don't think the government's given quite enough thought to the sustainability yep. on the landlord side given that it's predominantly individuals and very small businesses yep. i thought actually that there were some guidelines about um, bank mortgages and there was more of a financial stress test mm -hmm. and you had to show that you had means to, um, you know, account for... Did you mean guidelines that the lenders used? Well, I, <laughs> I'm not sure, and I, I can't remember mm -hmm. if it was the CML that mm -hmm. had issued it, but they had given this undertaking that in future we wouldn't be giving financial aid mortgages unless mm -hmm. landlord could meet these new, more stringent tests. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the Bank of England did some analysis on loan books and saw that saw a bit of a worrying picture in terms of the buy to let uh, market. Yeah, but I underneath the carpet of that though is people they will enter into a standard mortgage but then they'll go to the mortgage lender and ask for for consent and, and say look this will be temporary and anecdotally I know that's how a lot of people do this and they've got that not maybe showing up on yeah. the, de the debtor's book that actually there's yeah. all of these consents being issued because mm -hmm. otherwise it does affect the interest rate. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, and also I thought the 28 days notice that tenants have given out that could cause problems for landlords then because they're really not getting very much notice at all for the tenant to come to an end. And if they can't get another tenant mm -hmm. and, and the property's empty for a while, mm -hmm. there's. Um, yeah, that was quite controversial during yeah. yeah. the passages as well. Yeah, well, why, it's such well, a why allow people on the other end of the bargain such a quick exit? Well, the, the, the policy reason for that was, and uh, <coughs> I think that came about due to campaigning which took, took place around the, the passage of the, of the bill, and it was. Uh, I think the, the main reason given was that it wouldn't allow um, potential victims of domestic violence to be able to exit the contract soon enough mm -hmm. um, so they could you know, be, be liable for three months' rent when they need to escape a scenario yeah. and they need to get out quickly. Uh -huh. um, that, was a, that was an amendment to the, to the, to the bill and it was a quite a late amendment. So it didn't, the explanation for it didn't feature in any um, of the initial policy documents. Uh, although it may be in the, I don't know if there's a, a final policy memorandum for the act, I suppose there isn't actually, because you only get that at the beginning, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but you can, well, you can see that you would think that the social circumstances of a lot of people within that sector mean that it's in their best interest to get them 
20 days flexibility mm -hmm. and there'll be um, extreme examples of domestic abuse. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see why a lot of lawyers would, would find that a hard thing to, to, to swallow. It's interesting that it did get in there. It's also maybe because you're meeting the um, landlords used to be able to get rid of people so quickly. You would serve your notice to quit at the same time as giving them an 85 and the lease. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the way then yeah. you could just pull the trigger yeah. uh, whenever you want to. But it has swung things around. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose part of that is maybe um, sending a, or saying to prospective landlords and current landlords that if you're involved in or you want to be involved in renting out a property to someone, then you need to think about that very seriously, and you need to think about what if things do go wrong, yeah. because as we know, uh, in our organisation, they, they do go wrong. Well, my perception quite frequently, but I'm sure that's not reflective of the whole of the whole sector. So, I think there are some landlords who haven't quite got that seriousness of, of, what, of what it means to rent out property. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ha haven't prepared themselves for, you know, um, having a, you know, like a, a, a set of money, so some money set aside to instruct solicitors to to do the, the necessary thing, and uh, in some circumstances, of it. So I think that was potentially that's a, one of the other things that will come out of this legislation as well. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Has there been any undertaking given to? Review the impact because obviously we're engaging in speculation about how landlords will behave and whether there's a new act and how tenants will behave. And obviously, landlords made all sorts of bad warnings about what might come to pass if, these, if the legislation was allowed. So, it would be interesting to have sort of a couple of years down the line to see what the actual yeah. consequences were of the change. Yeah, okay. Where are these dire warnings? warnings well, the landlords were saying that effectively that uh, it would be uneconomic for landlords to rent because they couldn't guarantee they would get their rent, they couldn't evict quickly enough in terms of rent or years, the issues around the quick tenants notice. So basically they were saying it would be an uneconomic proposition for us because of these changes which have tilted the rights in the tenants' direction. Mm -hmm. There was um, I can't remember. We that was on the uh, committee stage that we mm -hmm. were pushing for to get a commitment from the minister on, and I'm pretty sure there was a there was a commitment to review within mm -hmm. three years or something like that right. by government, so yeah. a government review. But the, the other thing that as an organisation that we'll be pushing for is to get a committee in the Scottish Parliament to look at the issues separately mm -hmm. as well. So um, it's important. Yes, yeah, really important that this gets scrutinised because. I think probably my own uh, personal fear, or my biggest concern would be that the agreement is not used at all and people continue to use short, short tenancy uh, uh, agreements. And while that, that might be very challengeable in, in tribunals and, and things like that, uh, if you have access to all the advice that you need, we, you know, I know that quite a lot of uh, what happens in the private rent sector falls outside of those kind of dispute resolution. Yeah, I would definitely forward, see so under enforcement of the act yeah. as being a live issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be a degree of that. Yeah. I think the other thing that's worth throwing into the mix is um, is um, is housing benefit, of course, soon going to become universal credit, because that's for years been a backdoor method of rent control, because the government for many years has had minimum as it standards about the rent being too high above the market level and the tenant occupying uh, too small a space or too big a space and of course we have the floor over the bedroom tax. That was partly uh, that was mainly about the extension to the public sector of that private sector mm -hmm. model and saying we won't pay you for a house, it's too big for you. So de facto there's been rent control by the back door throughout the end of the years. But of course that's going to get devolved. So the Scottish government's going to be a position of directly affecting the income of some landlords because of the way they set housing benefit levels and the extent to which they copy these existing constraints of how high the rental you allow for benefit mm -hmm. purposes is and how big the house you allow for benefit purposes is. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, that and having 
multiple benefits to tables in one lump sum, I think. Mm -hmm. And the entangling of that would be a, a huge concern for, yeah. for private landlords. Um, and there would still be questions about the uh, powers that the Scottish Government have, or I don't think have them at the moment, or I can't quite remember the, the timeline, but it's certainly not um, proposing to use them in the in the short term, but mm. we've got an ambition to use them in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, about how, how flexible and responsive that will be, because obviously UK uh, benefit administration is one level of mm. administration, then you're kind of effectively adding another level on and we know that, that, um, that uh, benefit administration doesn't work very well now mm. for many people. So that I would be a bit concerned personally about mm -hmm. uh, about some of the new powers from that perspective. Uh, although they could they could be used to mm -hmm. to improve improve things for many people as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I should ask one thing. In terms of if a, if a tenant falls into a period of say about three months, is there a means by which the landlord could reclaim that? Um, like if they can't pay their rent, I'd, I'd imagine we'd be able to get the damages or anything like that. Is there, or is the landlord just a lot after that? Well, well, I mean, you have an agreement between landlord and tenant to pay rent for uh, uh, occupation of the property. So I think, as, as with any other debt, you'd be able to pursue that mm -hmm. as a landlord. Well, having said that, I think from anecdotal uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> conversations with uh, with landlords, it's quite rare for them to. And be able to to get that um, that rent yeah. that rent back. Actually, I I've, I've heard that there are problems for social landlords rent because they do pursue mm. unpaid rent, and what happens is um, often if you go to the heritable courts and the sheriff courts, they um, well they will delay making a decision on it. So in effect, you actually have maybe six months, well, three months of arrears, but then the re so housing association raises the action and then actually it goes on for three months, six months, and it keeps getting delayed. Yeah. And they're a sort of clearing house for this debt. So those yeah. massive um, like amounts owed still. Yeah. So, mm. so reclaiming it for social housing, I think, is a, is a big problem because they do go after it. Is that right? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, they're really well-regulated organisations, and I imagine part of their if they didn't do it, then it would come up in a, through a financial audit. Why you yeah. are claiming all this money that you're owed? Um, but I think there's maybe a sense that because they are large organisations, uh, relatively well-funded, that they can bear obviously a, a bit more. Uh, Bit more debt from the, from their tenants in that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, although it is it is an issue for many associations. Yeah. And I think a lot of the private rent to safe landlords are content just to keep the deposit if they've taken a large deposit, and that might not be the full amount of rent owed, but it can mitigate the loss if they can seize the deposit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really hard to um, get the deposit because the has got to be paid into the. Well, of course, that's true. That, that's that's um, going to change. I think it's yeah. really hard actually mm. to get any money out of them. You can uh, landlords can now see careers from that from the deposit money via the scheme providers. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons. I say that that's limited to two months rent uh, deposit. So not that a reason. Yeah. Well, we don't have mm. anything else. So just a. Uh, no, no one really challenged the uh, idea that landlords should be doing this at all. <laughs> like <laughs> everyone wants to be, uh, landlords should be providing security of tenure. Oh, you mean nobody questions the principle in the parliament? No. Yeah. Or no, yeah. In, in this room as well, yeah. no one seems. Well, oh, you just told for the worst. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it does. It is very striking. I I think that picture that you showed of a real swing in how. The, the market is working in that area, but also, yeah, like James says, like the worst in Europe. Yeah. Or something. It's quite difficult to look at that slide and go, no, we should be a smaller <laughs> red van. They say that they say that in mainland Europe, renting is more of a thing. Like people yeah. don't buy their houses as much, and I guess that's because their rentals are 
more secure yeah. and better. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think it's, it's usually capacity with Germany and Austria, so it's really low rates of, of ownership. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure we are, there's, there's media line, we don't, we're terribly out of line. They're actually, compared to all you because I don't think we are. But yeah. we really are, there's a really big difference between Germany and Austria. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think the balance has swung a bit too far, I have to say. Yeah. But, All right. Yeah. yeah. But we'll see how it works. Yeah. We'll see how it works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested to see how it works. When I first looked at the bill, I thought that this was like a sort of nationalisation. Yeah. Like, theoretically, uh -huh. because particularly if you look at it from the lease, that it was like the death nail to the, the fact that the lease is a contract. Mm -hmm. Boom! It's gone mm -hmm. because they can no, they now need to get asked to court to yeah. bring the contract to an end, mm -hmm. which for the sort of Anglo-American concept of a contract or a lease just makes it look nothing like yeah. mm -hmm. a lease anymore at mm -hmm. all. Um, yeah. It's, but it's more of a principle theoretical idea yeah. about how you describe what a lease is. Yeah. So, so this idea that you can't just bring it to an end because you have a right as yeah. a as a lease, the other mm -hmm. party to the lease. You now need to justify it to the court. It's it a, a socially a very special kind of contract because you're providing shelter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you before some, someone says it's not like bank marks as a bank of the supermarket. Actually, that, that is quite similar. <laughs> but it's not like you know, many other contracts. And that's, and that's yeah, and of course that's why it's so heavy, heavily regulated, mm -hmm. sort of post-war years and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was just a theoretical point. You know, yeah. Because. Contract is like just disappearing. It's been disappearing in the post-war years because of regulation mm. and what a contract is. Yeah. Well, but how do you update means dictum? So we go from contract, from status to contract, and then where do we go? To regulation. regulation. So it's that's what Hugh Collins says is yeah. his things now about its regulation. Well, if it was up to us, we would probably have the secure tenancy style. Uh, so the, the tenancy use in the social rented sector, or the, uh, uh, that kind of agreement in the in the private rented sector, but you know, it's a uh, step too far, I think, for uh, uh -huh. regulators. Yeah, just because I'm interested in the concept that the contract doesn't say I wouldn't disagree yeah. with that idea. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. We'll, yeah, we'll thank you in the customary way. Yeah. <laughs>